two. One, two. Yeah. Hi. That's too much. Hi. Yeah, one, two. Yeah, just give it a... Hi. Hi, everyone. So we're going to get started soon. Um, there are, I think there are a few seats over there. And then um, we're reserving the front row seats for the uh, students, because they will be going on the talk rather quickly. So thanks for coming. And my name is Taeyun Choi. Um, I'm an artist and an educator and a co-founder of the School for Poetic Computation. And so first thing first, um, today will be a series of short talks by the incoming students. So they all came from different parts of the world um, to spend 10 weeks with us. And I'm so excited to share what they're up to. Um, first of all, I have to thank um, the people who were the, um, they were the admissions committee for these students. So there were a few people who helped us um, select these students. So, so we have a large pool of applicants, and we need to go through our admissions process. And those people were uh, people like Golan Levin, who were uh, artist in residence last year. And then Morshin Alahari, who's a, a teacher this term. And uh, Anne TBD, who's a TA this term, but she was a student before. And Ng, who was also a student. And um, April, who was a student. So these folks were community of the SIPC. So they helped us find the, um, the best students and make this selection possible. So I, I want to thank them first for um, have giving us the chance to work with these wonderful students. I think there's a little bit of feedback. Maybe the overall volume could be turned off. Yeah, right. So uh, I, will, I wrote a letter for, for the incoming students. So I'd like to start the day by reading that letter to all of you. This is a letter for young art students, young in practice and young in heart. I went back to the art school that I went to, which I did not return for 15 years. And there are reasons why I never went back. But more broadly, there's reasons why I didn't want to visit that time in my life as an artist. In fact, I did everything I could to avoid going back. First, there were societal reasons. I was attending an art school during and right after 9-11, Bush Jr.'s war on terror. And Chicago and Midwest and US in general was not a very supportive place for a person of color. There were everyday confrontations towards people who looked like me. But to some degree, today we have the same kinds of administration and culture that's no less unaccepting. So more importantly, I didn't see anyone who looked like me in a place of respect as an artist or educator. The academia felt very white, male, and those people remain powerful. When there were attempts of multiculturalism, it was often in a breaching, bleaching act of legitimizing otherness according to their whiteness. Therefore, I thought this is not a place for me to grow. So I grew out of the school as soon as possible and never looked back. When I returned, I walked through the library, the museum, the familiar architecture on the campus, and familiar faces of artists and teachers. I felt all of my memories collapsing, thoughts that were unresolved, and yet still in process. Walking through the museum, visiting the artworks that were fundamental for forming my understanding of art, I had a revelation. To be fair, I actually had a great time learning art. But there were moments of isolation. I felt like a consumer at a large academic institution that I was paying to get a degree. Part of that is true. 
But more importantly, I don't think I reached out to get help or connect with others or seek mentorship. I, find, I found people who either looked like me or had a similar interest and developed an intimate friendship, but I didn't venture out actively. Now that I teach in this unique institution and, and also in other universities, I have this gravity of responsibility that I want to share with all of you as artists and educators. I'm looking at you, person of color, people who don't identify as one gender or the other, people with disability and impairment, and all of your in uniqueness that society renders you as others. So the place is for you, you should be here, and I'm speaking to you to be here. On the other hand, there's a more general struggle of balancing between internal growth as an artist and connecting with others. Studying art means you're dedicating your time and talent into your practice, craft, and self-expression and critical inquiry. When you're building your practice, this means you're building your own world, a palace. And I want to quote Marshall Berman from a book, All That Is Solid Melts Into Air, where he writes, it can be a creative adventure for a modern man to build a palace, and yet a nightmare to have to live in it. He's actually quoting uh, notes from Underground by Dostoevsky. It's easy for you to be isolated in a world you create. You may find yourself trapped in the world you create. Your universe, your palace, might be a na nightmare because no one else is there. When you're actively building your own practice, it's hard to reach out, hard to let other people enter that world because your world is really fragile at this moment. And there's a big disconnection between your idea, intention, and the resources and skills that you have at hand. It's easy to feel discouraged and not believe in yourself. And yet you need to take the courage to connect with others through art. In the, art, in the end, art is a reflection of yourself and also an amplification of your message. Deciding art as a profession comes with great uncertainty. Most often, it's a space of discomfort. But being an artist is about inviting yourself to be uncomfortable and imagining a different story of what that place can be. I think this training of becoming uncomfortable is what artists and art schools try to do. And artists and art students have a great potential to challenge and reimagine the way that we see the world. And recently I was invited by some art schools to imagine, to innovate themselves for the future as a consultant. And I was actually not interested in helping art students become more technological according to the logic of tech. Rather, I was interested in what we can learn as a, as a society at large from the art schools, the traditional design and craft schools. In other words, what the technologists could learn from artists. Today, we see the world through a certain computational logic. So what's the role of an artist today? And I think it is to be critical and to challenge what it means to work with computers and what it means to bring poetry through machines. Studying art is definitely not as predictable or you know, profitable as becoming a developer. So how do we position ourselves in a society that values innovation over invention? And then the key distinction here is that innovation values progression that's linear, and the invention values the propagation of ideas that are transgressive. So this is a case against innovation. All things recently easy 
all things machine learning, AI, optimization, entrepreneurship, that's thrown around to fill in the void. So as an artist, your practice, your act of invention in the context of art, among a community of, a community of artists, it helps us to imagine a future outside of that bubble of efficiency. To return to my college that I went to, the building was, is located on a built, um, old museum that's, that was built for 1933 World's Fair. The motto was, science finds, industry applies, man conforms. A century of progress. My friend, Joan, uh, my friend Joanne interprets it as a science explores, technology executes, man conforms. So perhaps it is our job as artists to explore science, apply the industrial technique of computation to create poetic gestures that don't ask humans to conform to technology. Thank you. So, yeah. I'm super excited for today. So we're going to have four minutes each for the students. And um, I'm going to ask you to pass on the lavalier mark so, so that you could pass it on to the next speaker. So pass the mic to the next speaker. Yeah. So I'll be like that. All right. Uh, so what's up, y'all? I'm Nabil. I'm one of the students here. Uh, I'm very glad to be here, not in the tech industry as I was last month. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, so just to give you all a sense of kind of some of the things that I've done in the past that brought me here, not very directly. Um, I studied math and computer science at NYU. I worked in public schools both here and down in Arkansas, and I now volunteer in schools. Um, I did political organizing work uh, in the Movement for Black Lives here in New York City uh, with the goal of abolishing prisons and police. Um, and I came to SFPC uh, last summer and did a program called Code Narratives, um, where I made a rhyme generator art project. Um, so I think a lot about the connections between technology and imperialism. Like even that rhyme, that rhyme generator made me think about that. You can go to my blog, which I'll give you a link to at the end if you want to read what it is that I think about that. Um, and so of course, spending time uh, here, this is the building that uh, used to be associated with Bell Labs, also makes me think about that. Um, so for those who don't know, Bell Labs uh, is a very important company in software history. Uh, it laid the foundations for a lot of the technology that we still use today. Um, and like a lot of those companies, they worked very closely with the US military, uh, which I oppose. Um, but of course, that isn't the only history of this space. Um, in indigenous people were here first everywhere in this land. The, the, the Lenape people once lived here. Um, and there's also a lot of radical queer black history uh, in this neighborhood. Uh, and that, that, that history is not done. It's still ongoing. Um, but there's a lot of policing that's going on to interfere with that. Um, and Stonewall is now a pro-cop, uh, white-dominated bar. Um, so I wonder a lot, like, what is my place here? You know, like, it probably sounds very silly um, to say that I feel homesick when I'm rooted in Crown Heights. Like, I live close enough to bike. Other people traveled here from across the world. Um, but that is sometimes uh, how I feel. And feelings like this, uh, I think, are very common for black people. I'll give just one example from my old job. Um, some people were, so I worked remotely. I didn't even have to go into the office or whatever. But even in work chat, it really ground on my nerves the way some people were praising Elon Musk's space launch last month or January, whenever that was. Um, now I'm a socialist, so of course I hate all billionaires. Like, how could you just monopolize that kind of wealth while other people are starving and homeless? That's disgusting behavior. Um, so of course, I'm not at all excited about this white male settler billionaire um, ex exporting racism and sexism to space. Um, so my perspective on this was illustrated actually some years before Elon Musk was born um, by Emery Douglas of the Black Panthers. We have this pig rocket, right? The pig, of course, being the Black Panthers symbol for the police and for soldiers, because they saw these as part of the same system. Um, and they have some basic logic, right? Like, whatever is good for the oppressor has got to be bad for us. Um, so I played this poem at my work chat. No toilets, no lights, but Whitey's on the moon. I wonder why he's up in me, because Whitey's on the moon. Well, I was already giving him 50 a week, and now Whitey's on the moon. Taxes taking my whole damn check. The junkies make me a nervous wreck. The price of food is going up. And as if all that crap wasn't enough. 
So I encourage you uh, to check out that poem and see the rest of what Gil Scott Heard has to say. I only have a few minutes, though, so I want to just wrap up by saying that these are the art traditions that I identify with. Um, I literally have no idea what's going on in most of these museums in New York. And I say that like not as an insult. Like I, I literally just don't know. Because um, uh, I mean, uh, people really haven't made the connections clear for the communities that I care about and the values that I hold. Um, I do know that a lot of the abstract art was actually funded by the CIA specifically to distract attention from this kind of socially engaged art. So like, how do I relate to the art of some of these computational artists who actually were also closely associated with the military? Um, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I think these are, maybe there's some other things that I could draw, like these African fractals. But even that is like, it's not unproblematic, right? Like, this book is actually written by a white author. And so it's like, what is the lens that I'm getting into my own culture? I don't know. Uh, it's very difficult like, to make art for us as colonized peoples. Um, so what does all this mean? Like, what am I going to build and show at our showcase on April 20th and 22nd? I have no idea. Uh, so come out, it, you know, come, come back here again if you want to find out, because I honestly can't tell you now. Um, but just to share a few other things I have coming up, if you want to hear more about this kind of stuff from me, I'm going to be at this conference, Afrotechtopia, this weekend. Of course, I'll be at the, our final showcase. I'm one of the organizers of this conference, Bang Bang Con. Check us out. Um, there's a campaign against new jails being built in New York that I really want to get involved with. Um, as part of the, uh, the movement for police and prison abolition. Um, I just finished up an article that will be published in print next month and then online in June, um, really going into like, much more depth about all these kind of things, thinking about um, computing and imperialism and climate change and all these things in an integrated way. Uh, and then there's more stuff. Um, you know, just come talk to me, see what's up. Um, and like I said, I'm trying not to work in the tech industry again, so if you have any work, uh, let me know about that. Um, and yeah. Mic work, I think it does. Um, hi, I'm Sukanya. Um, I write code. This is some of the creative coding work I've been doing. Um, but this is not really what I wanted to talk to you about. What I want to talk to you about is hardness and softness. And excuse the very simplistic image. Um, but I spent most of my life in India, specifically in Delhi, amongst 20 million other people. And India is a hard place. It's a very complex place. And it requires a certain hardness and a certain thick skinness to get by. Um, whether it's about the poverty or the population, the corruption, the patriarchy, the list goes on. Um, and basically, if, you, if you're sensitive, you're going to get overwhelmed by the place. Um, and so I want to share a project with you which kind of relates to this in some way, one kind of hardness. Um, and I call this the groping machine. Um, I'll let the video play. This is unfortunately a very, very common thing in India in public places. Um, and I created this at the School of Machines in Berlin two years back. There's a story why the documentation is terrible. I can tell you later. Um, but there were, we were 12 students from about 10 different countries. So we started having a lot of conversations about where we come from. And this is something that came up, what it is like to be a woman in India. Um, and I mean, this is what I mean by that hardness. It requires some amount of thick skinness to be able to deal with this on a regular basis. Uh, and I kind of want to jump to something else. This is, these are questions from the website Quora. I'm just going to read a few out. I'm on the brink of suicide. What should I do to regain motivation? How do I change myself into a straight boy? How can I gain more confidence to flirt? This is kind of what I'm talking about when I talk about softness. I think there's a sort of rawness and honesty of vulnerability in these questions. And this is not something we talk about very much at home in India. And these days, when we start to talk about it, it's kind of through the lens of mental illness, and it's sort of pathologized almost. And I found this very interesting. And I wanted to see if I could use a very hard medium, if I could use code and technology to talk about these softer things in some way, and to see if I could um, have a machine kind of capture some essence of this. And so I trained a machine on a very large data set of questions from this website. And it started asking things like this. How can I express myself? How can I accept my life? How do I do peace? How do I deal with my family? And interestingly, people started replying, which was very surprising and made the project really enjoyable for me. They started empathizing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and sometimes just had these really funny responses. <laughs> Um, 
And this was part of also what, what made this project really enjoyable, that I could share it with my friends and that we could have a good laugh about it. And on that note, I want to share another project with you, which I call InstaFace. Uh, so this is my alternative social media feed. These are procedurally generated faces, and you can keep scrolling in your phone endlessly. And I think it's very similar to social media, because the content is slightly different, but mostly the same. Um, but coming back to this, to hardness and softness, I find myself sort of negotiating this balance and interplay between these things very often. And it's, it's kind of living in this contradiction, because India demands for me to be very hard. And I see art as something, I mean, sorry. But, I see art as something that does require some softness and some sensitivity. And I do see myself as a sensitive person. So it is a bit of a contradiction that I find myself living with. Um, and I think it's being on this continuum, continuum and negotiating the space that has brought me to SFPC. And I see it as a place to kind of allow myself to be a little softer amongst a very exciting community. Um, and yeah, that's it. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Ailadi, I'm Italian, and uh, I like to draw, uh, so I'll show you like uh, some drawings, and these are like just some, and then some a little bit like more dimensional, that's an inflatable, and that's like uh, an arm pillow for people that don't like to sleep, uh, like hug in a rectangle. <laughs> and so I like drawing, but then like if I don't draw, I get like grumpy. So I always need to find like uh, excuses and ideas to draw like in different uh, ways and uh, find like something to draw. And so th the solution for me are like constraint. And uh, so I'll go through a series of constraint. Like this is a little bit like when I was a child and I was asking my mom, okay, what do I draw? And my mom was like saying, but uh, with the uh, like, a subject uh, that uh, like uh, I'm more like interested in. So this like I did like this website with my boyfriend, and people ask. Uh, I, uh, we ask uh, people to submit like a, a law that they think will be like in the future, and uh, I do a drawing and then post uh, like the the poster like uh, on the on the website and to the person that uh, sent the law. So if you have idea future law, <laughs> and. Um, then uh, this uh, I just moved like uh, to I um, to to Shanghai and like so much was going on like around me and I tried to remember at least like uh, one day that happened like uh, during the day through like uh, a drawing and so sometimes it was like uh, just hard uh, like to to choose uh, like uh, what uh, like what to draw and okay here I show you the reality because it was like much more fun <laughs> <laughs> and then. Uh, Sometimes uh, it was like not much, uh, and I threw out like this exercise. Actually, I found that uh, I was observing like uh, more like throughout the day what was going on like around me, just to uh, to find like stuff to 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 draw. And sometimes it was like just work, yeah. and I was posting uh, yeah on uh, on Instagram and. Uh, so this is, was a constraint that was uh, for another purpose, but ended up like feeding the um, the clothes, uh, the um, uh, drawing truck, and uh, so like our lovely consumism decided that like if you have a cloth and then it got stained, oh that's like no, <laughs> it's a dead cloth, and uh, there were like a context where I didn't feel like challenged that, like at work I was working. Yeah. As a designer in Prague, and like, and uh, so I started like a painting over like uh, the stain, and that was okay. But then like I got invited to like two <laughs> weddings, and I didn't want uh, like to embarrass like my parents with the family, and yeah, sometimes. So I took like some drawings, I made a pattern, and uh, and then I wore the <laughs> dress. And, like, and my mom was happy that. Okay, <laughs> and then here like a reiteration of the uh, one remember one thing a day, but like uh, this time uh, uh, with like uh, gif, 
And this is like, uh, okay, when uh, you you're abroad for a while, you go back home and all your friends have kids. <laughs> 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 Brexit. And then, like that lady that found like this like amazing, efficient way to actually clean uh, like <laughs> beside <laughs> like the elevator with a minimum like effort. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so there is like a lot of like and uh, here, like I think, like constraint and enabler, like it's SFPC, and I like, know I want to do like drawings that are like more somehow animated, interactive, but I don't know yet. <laughs> uh, let's see. Thank you. Um, my name is Nisha, Nisha Totong, or you can call me Fame. Um, that's my name, it's a long story, why is it, but you can come to me after. <laughs> um, so I work as a, uh, why is it? Um, sorry. Um, so I work as a visual designer for more than, t uh, about 10 years. And I do like graphic design, art direction, and most of my client is like musician, happen to be. Um, I also um, draw and um, do animation as well. Um, this is like, um, music video piece that I did. Um, and um, it's a frame by frame animation and I love ta transition, I love the in between frames. Um, but most of my work at the time is still follow client need. And then after that I moved to New York and um, I was at, I had my master degree at Parsons, um, Design and Technology. Um, I still keep, stick with my medium that doing like animation, but I, uh, made this animation, which is I interested at the time about like unconscious moment, and I had lucid dream, and um, the medium was like perfect to create unreal visual magic on the screen. Um, then uh, my body was like this. Um, cause like basically I um, draw like every frame in, in front of computer. I stay most of the time in front of my laptop and um, that made me think and um, at the time I also want to get away from uh, my comfort zone which is like doing like animation or like visual. So I made this series, it's a variable series. Um, it's called Atomatic Mind Body. So it's a series of whimsical wearable devices that highlight the disconnect between mind and body in sedentary lifestyle. So this is keyboard. Um, so basically you can wear this keyboard on your upper body and then you can tap on this embroider letter which is conductive kind of thread and then you will be like moving like this to be my full uh, practice typing um, as well as like correct your posture because it will send message to your screen if you sit in bad posture. And this is the same series called Click Kick. And how it works is like you move around like a dancing. Uh, um, yeah, you move around like dancing and to move the mouse on the screen and you are kicking action to click. Um, <laughs> this is the last one is called Technique. So basically it's a color piece that disrupt the weather uh, helping them avoid staying in a bad posture longer than this eye. So if you stay in bad posture too long, like look at in your smartphone, it will send message to you. Um, so as um, Taeyun said before, I like whimsical interaction. Like I like uncomfortable, like this is um, a collab project with Tyler Henry and Mary Park. <laughs> it's a video game that basically you move like a giant tongue to lick the ice cream on the screen. Um, so like thinking about action of licking ice cream is like a tiny gesture, but then you have to like work out to like 
um, lick ice cream. So like I like that kind of interaction that like you um, doing like this whimsical thing and that really grab attention, but also like make people feel uncomfortable at the same time. <laughs> um, so, uh, so why I'm here at SAPC? Um, so maybe I didn't mention before, but I really bad at math since high school. I kind of gave up math and um, during master degree, I was like always avoid doing like a heavy math stuff. Um, I think like it's not just I making work that make people uncomfortable. I also have to be uncomfortable to be able to grow. And um, the other reason is like, um, sorry, um, this is my brothers and uh, my older brother was a student at SAPC on spring 2014 and he passed away last year because of cancer and he always say like he's a anti-disciplinary artist and I feel like to be able to be anti-disciplinary artist is really brave because like basically you cross the line that you feel and like it's not easy like and it's uncomfortable, but that's how we grow and learn. And that's how I um, always keep this in mind, and that's why I'm here. Um, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Sid. <coughs> Before SFPC, I was working as a barista, and I carry that with me. So if I remember you, I hope it's because you tipped well. <laughs> um, and I like to make a lot of things, but especially little gifts, like other people. Um, I think gifts work really well for both like elevating mundane little kind of moments, but also being a little creepy. Obviously, my two interests. <laughs> Um, but especially being queer and trans, I think there's often this like narrative to reclaim being a monster. But for me, I feel more like a ghost that like doesn't know what it needs to be freed. Um, and so I think that like comes through in just this like weird fascination with mundane stuff. Um, I also make still things. I like to make things that make people smile, which seems sort of obvious, but I think when I get really down on myself for like technical inabilities, I did not go to art school, I do not have an MFA, <laughs> um, it's good to be like, no, I'm doing this because I like this. Um, and that also goes for making stuff to celebrate like myself and my community and our politics um, and trying to find that balance between your activism can't just be like this aesthetic thing, but you also need to take time to come back to yourself and be like, no, it's, it's true, we're doing a good thing. Um, I'm much more confrontational in my like writing and talking to people. I can have art that's just like kind of nice. Mm -hmm. uh, academically, I'm interested in linguistics, specifically like sociolinguistics of text and writing. And obviously, there's a lot of that on the internet. Uh, you go from like gender and cybering to input methods with different keyboards. Um, I also think study spo is a really weird internet phenomenon. You can ask me about that. <laughs> um, my pet peeve is, though, complaining, em comparing emoji to hieroglyphics. If you say that to me, I assume <laughs> you don't understand either of them. Um, so don't do that. So, uh, that. OK, there we go. Um, so into SFPC, taking that idea of like the mundane and the creepy, but also my linguistic interests, I want to use code as it relates to like human labor. And I'm training my robot replacement. Um, <laughs> Because currently, humans are still more exploitable than robots. Like, humans get sick, you hire a new one. Robots, they break down. And that's really interesting to me. Um, then code as poetry in its own kind of discourse in the writing of it, in the different languages. Um, and then all the way over there, code as making new internet spaces, spaces like defined with code. And I'd really love to finish this zine that's about being trans on Grindr. <laughs> um, that probably won't happen here, but in general. Uh, and those are other places to find me. Um, so yeah, come say hi. <laughs> yeah. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Yael. I'm a designer when I'm not at SFPC. Um, for SFPC, for the first time ever, I submitted stuff that was in folders or in my drawers that I've never showed or printed. I am trying to see if I can call it art. So artist is kind of still in quotation marks for me. Um, yeah, I also had a ha moment when I saw this image. This is, um, this is how I perceive the world. I'm an immigrant and I'm always going back and forth between different stages. I kind of exist in a space where I have to fill in the gaps. So when I look at an image like this, for me this is, is it inside, is it outside, is it loud, is it quiet? And this is kind of the way that um, I want to talk about some stuff that I'm going to show. Um, some of my making is about deconstructing to reconstruct and looking at multiple layers of meaning. So what does it mean to take an eye, deconstruct it, and create something that might talk to me about facial recognition? What are the two layers that I'm constantly moving between when I'm looking at um, reconstructing new things from defamiliarized but yet familiar elements? Um, once again, layering narratives that make you go back and forth and questioning um, what are you looking at, what is the own personal narrative that you might bring into these things. Um, also very interested in linear versus nonlinear elements. So as you can see, I read a lot on the screen. Not too proud of it. Um, but the idea of taking all those segments and putting them together and thinking about it as a library, if you wish to compare it to looking at the spines of the books in a library. Uh, in a similar manner, also talking about inside and outside, who said that the content has to be inside an email? What happens if I just place a note that is only made out of subject, li subject lines? And I'm kind of constantly thinking about linear and nonlinear, and um, what does it mean inside and outside? I'm interested in um, what could happen when, ah, secret, don't look. Um, interested in what could happen when I'm working with tools in a different way. So who said that I cannot draw on my record player? And what's interesting to me with these is that even though a record would always sound the same, I cannot recreate the exact same things. So kind of exploiting the tool a little bit. In a similar manner, I was collaborating with a friend. We each gave each other assignments. I was assigned um, the content of a video and the tool of a table saw to make a book, because clearly, why not? Um, and the challenge of what does it mean to use a tool for something that it's not meant to, you can see that the paper suffered a little bit, but the output was making a book and understanding that the imperfections are embedded into the process and actually make the process more valuable. Um, so there is an output of a book, but it doesn't have binding, and the page don't match exactly, and it's, again, inside versus outside. I'm here at SF SFPC because I'm thinking recently about spaces that are not permanent and about archiving and how sometimes the positive aspect of archiving is something that we want to preserve, and sometimes the negative is about deleting and, and forgetting about stuff. And it's related to a project. I've been documenting a hotel over the past six years, completely randomly started, but these are different rooms and the numbers that you're looking at are the room numbers. I'm looking at the most intimate internal element of this as well as what is on the outside. And I'm thinking about these as containers. All the rooms looks, look the same all the time, but when somebody enters and stays in those rooms, they create a narrative. And when the people that work at the hotel come and clean the room, they're basically um, deleting what was earlier there. So the questions that I have are, do invisible narrative exist? What are they? Where do they exist? What is the voice to talk about them? Is it critical? Is it poetic? And what spatial form would they take? Um, basically thinking about space and audio, and once again, inside and outside. Thank you. Hi, my name's Kelly Monson. Um, a little bit of a background. Um, hold on. Um, I'm a web developer by trade. 
originally from the Bay Area, um, currently based in NYC. I went to art school for two years, finished off at UC Berkeley, um, had a little bit of disillusionment with both of them for like opposite reasons. Um, and uh, I moved here to get started in the tech industry as has to do with media. Um, so a few years ago, I uh, started collecting cell phones and taking them apart and making kind of sculptures out of them. So this is um, kind of uh, just making this weird inter interface with like buttons from another piece. They unfortunately don't do anything, but I'd eventually <laughs> want them to. <laughs> Um, and uh, here's some other ones. Oops, um, that kind of ruined everything, but okay. Um, no, no. Yes. Okay, we're back. Okay. Now, here, I'm just trying to learn how to operate this. Okay. Now you've seen my entire slideshow. <laughs> so here's a one with like some fake foliage inside a Droid X. Here is a plaster one with um, like a iPod Nano screen. Um, I'm sure some of you might be familiar with this uh, one. One not only because you've already seen the slide, but because it's <laughs> it's uh, this um, e-meter uh, created by the Church of Scientology. Here's the unveiling of a giant one. Um, <laughs> and they use it basically to in interrogate their um, uh, members. And I did a recreation of one um, that uh, uses a heart monitor and um, a skin conductance sensor, and it's with Arduino. And then the, the dial kind of moves along um, according to the input. Um, I've also done um, a lot of uh, generative like kind of stuff a little bit in my spare time like creative coding stuff um, this is available on the like my business website just there um, this one's a little bit harder to explain um, basically uh, it's this uh, it's this uh, fictional cryptocurrency that I built a website for um, I'm gonna try to get it yeah there it goes um, and uh, it's kind of, it's kind of in the spirit of like a time cube or like one of those um, uh, pseudo scientific uh, websites that you can find online if you look closely enough. Um, my goals for SFPC, I don't really want to um, say that I have any goals. I kind of just mostly want to learn and see if I come up with something new. But one idea I had was to make people fill out a web form using only a joystick. <laughs> um, ultimately, what I'm drilling down to is kind of um, finding irrationality in the technical and finding ridiculousness in the unsettling. That's kind of like what I find myself into mostly in my work. Um, Here's, I, I really like this picture. I think it's a good example of what I'm, try, I'm looking at. Um, this is a telepresence robot with Edward Snowden at a TED Talk, because of, <laughs> of course it's a TED Talk. And um, I, I, I really like it because it's like awkwardly trying to ev evoke a human presence. And it's not even at face level with the other presenter. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like this kiosk on wheels. <laughs> and it's like, um, it, I, I don't know, it's like, um, it, it's, it's not doing very well at conveying a human presence, but people just think it's cool. F and my favorite part of this is that there's a screen in the background that doesn't show the actual video of Edward Snowden talking. It's a video of the machine with oh. Edward Snowden's face on it. <laughs> so it's like he is this awkward looking thing. So. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much what I have in four minutes. Um, that's me. Um, thank you. Hi, I'm Yeli. Um, I'm a maker of many sorts of things that live on the web. That circle looks distorted, but it's fine. Um, and um, I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, and I would say my upbringing was pretty conservative. And by conservative, I mean having a singular view of what the future looks like and what things are up for debate. Um, so there were things that we would take as givens, and one of those things was my career and um, what I would end up doing in my life. Um, 
but yeah, uh, sorry. But what ended up happening? <laughs> it's fine. What ended up happening was um, I went to school and I didn't really do what I was supposed to do. I ended up um, doing like making my own major at a school called Gallatin um, with a combination of computer science and art. Um, and um, while it took me a long time to articulate it, a lot of the work I want to explore here at SFBC and I have explored previously um, deals with this idea of disillusionment and getting to the point where you see things differently. Um, so um, during like my second year in school, um, I go through several periods of self-isolation. So this was one of them. And instead of like talking to people, I was spending a lot of time on social media, um, and I really couldn't like kind of get myself to leave the house. Um, so I worked on this project called Flatline, which just visualized my social media activity as an electrocardiograph. And the idea was um, seeing um, my activity as something that was so closely related to the act of living would get me to think about how, um, what it meant if I was living on social media um, and what that meant for my real life. Um, so fast forward to about eight months ago, I was working um, at a job in Silicon Valley that I don't mind. Um, so I had interned there the summer <laughs> before and um, um, when I first got there, I was like very amazed that firstly people were wearing shorts to work and like flip-flops, which was like wild to me. Um, but also that like they give you like lunch and dinner and breakfast. Um, or like they had like ping pong tables and my first thought was wow oh this company must really care about its employees um, which wasn't <laughs> really <laughs> the case <laughs> um, so like free dinner may mean free dinner or it may mean that I come to work at 8 and I stay till 7 because I want to get free food which was what happened a lot um, so and unlimited vacation days may be great if people actually took them when they were unlimited um, so I ended up making um, something called can you leave work um, which like, yeah, you would like put in something you needed or wanted to do um, and it would map it to some perk that a um, silicon tech company um, offered. So if you were like, I need to eat, it's like, well, there's food at work, like don't leave. Mm -hmm. um, or if you needed like to go buy something, they would tell you that, oh, Google has a concierge and you don't really have to leave work. And basically at the, you just never would leave work. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so recently, what I've been interested in making myself and other people see differently um, is data and language, so using data as revelation. Um, in her book, Men Explain Things to Me, um, Rebecca Solne talks about the power of, of language. Um, she says, if you lack words for a phenomenon or a situation, then you can't talk about it, which you can't, which means you can't address it or change it. So I've been thinking if um, the presence of a word means um, you can talk about it, what, um, if the absence of a word means you can't talk about it, what does the presence of a word mean? Like, what does the exuberance of a word and its synonym mean? So, like, what happens, what, what does it mean that we have, well, I know what it means, because we're sexist, um, <laughs> that um, we have, like, seven different words to describe a sexually promiscuous woman, and we have, like, we only got, like, fuck boy, like, two years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the other thing that I've been interested in is kind of related um, is about constructing identities online. So what goes in the bio and are we forced to put ourselves into boxes? Um, and secondly, the right to be forgotten um, and then the right to grow. So if you're on Twitter, you've probably seen like someone get dragged for something they said like when they were 10. Um, so I've been thinking about like the right to grow and how um, advertising or um, predictive models don't allow us to be different or to change. Um, so I think there's a lot of comfort in how things are and how we imagine they've always been. Um, but going through the process of reimagination and um, questioning for me has always been good and I'd like to help people kind of rethink a lot of the things they see as norms. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So that's the first. Thank you. Thank you. That's the first half of the uh, presenters. So up the restroom is in the hallway. There's three of them. And then there's some drinks. So see you in about 15 minutes.
and uh, there's a lot of postcards to uh, bring. Uh, grab it by the bar. So next up is Rachel. <laughs> I'm Rachel. Um, I came to SFPC from Los Angeles, uh, where I worked primarily as a designer, uh, designing branding, user experience, and uh, user interaction. Um, this is the logo I designed for a web app that I created um, it, with some friends. They, uh, we all came together to try and create this digital hub for ideas um, to help preserve um, or to help prevent idea decay. So you log in and it's a hub where you can uh, put in your ideas, uh, build them out, and then um, just have them stored there so when you think of something to add to it later, you can come back to it. Um, I also intern at this place called the Museum of Awe. Um, this is one of the exhibits that we uh, have curated at the establishment. Um, we are looking at our grains of sand with holes drilled in them. Um, and it's a metaphor of the people I work with they're visual strategists at the Jet Propulsion Lab at NASA. Um, and if you were to think of each grain of sand as a galaxy, um, it would take 10 rooms filled with sand to contain all of the galaxies that we know of. Um, and if you take a single grain and let that represent our Milky Way galaxy, the hole that's poked in it <laughs> represents the part of our Milky Way that we've explored looking for planets like Earth, looking for exoplanets. Um, and so we curate <laughs> experiences like this to try and um, invoke awe, uh, because there's also a lot of cool research being done about awe and what its social utility is and why we have it as humans. And it turns out there's a lot of altruistic and philanthropic um, effects uh, to experiencing awe. So if you want to talk to me about it a little more, if you want to research it, there's some really cool research to be seen out there. Um, I also make fun things. Uh, <laughs> so I, I really love animation and video games, and so I create fan art. And this is something I created earlier this year. Um, I sculpted a Totoro. It's about the size of a penny <laughs> and made a little environment for him. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, this is one of my favorite characters from uh, the Crash Bandicoot series, I tried to see what he would look like if we used the real materials from the game. Um, and so, but this is just what I do, so who am I really? What's my background? This is something that also fascinates me, uh, what the contexts are that shape our uh, dreams and our personalities. So um, I'm the daughter of two Indonesian immigrants. Um, they had three kids, and then 10 years later, they had me. <laughs> um, but <laughs> things were turbulent, and they got divorced. Um, and then, but my dad remarried, and this woman had three other children. Um, but there was a lot of things that went into trying to make our family work. There were culture clashes, and um, <laughs> there was gang activity and abuse and all this stuff, all this really heavy stuff. Um, but as a kid, I was four years old experiencing all of these older people doing, going through this very, very difficult time, and I wasn't a talker. So it, uh, it was hard connecting to them, and what I did was I started doing little things like making them breakfast and um, watching Jurassic Park, even though it gave me nightmares. Mm -hmm. um, and I built these relationships with them, and what I guess I'm trying to say is that these moments of connection are what I crave, um, not just in my family life, but as an artist. Um, and I haven't begun to really make work that I feel satisfies this, but this is one thing that does uh, make me feel like I've bared my soul when people watch it. Um, this is a watercolor I created for a short film I made. Um, if you want to watch it, let me know. I can share the link with you, but um, it's a story about two astronauts um, who have a daughter and how they connect as a family. Um, but yeah. <laughs> um, and that's me. <laughs> this is first. All right, 
So I'm Hans. Uh, I am. I'm Hans. I'm from Germany, the very south end of Germany. I live in San Francisco, and now I'm at SFPC. Um, this is my dad uh, playing with us. Uh, my sisters, my two sisters, and me when we were younger. So we grew up in this like very raw and greasy environment. He has a garage for trucks and cars, and <clears throat> this probably shaped like a pretty like. Uh, an identity that has like started being very familiar with all things, all things hardware, and uh, when I say like I'm from Germany, like uh, <laughs> so, it's not exactly the Germany that immediately comes into your mind. So I come from like a place that is like walking distance to Austria, like the beginning of the Alps. We have all sorts of like very weird customs that makes it like place like a bit magical. So this is like the Krampus and the Bishop like a Christian tradition married to like a patient tradition and they kind of mix in this weird way and we have end of those customs. So um, I am a radical collaborator. So I really enjoy working with others. I really enjoy sharing my knowledge and seeing how other people um, interpret it. I'm really excited about sharing all my deficits because I think this is the most productive way actually addressing them. And I'm actually not radical at all. I'm just <laughs> a collaborator. It's saying I, I come up with this like new words because the words collaboration and teamwork have just been quite misused, meaning like they mean actually really different things when it comes to like institutions, organizations, maybe industry, where knowledge is managed. And <clears throat> so being naturally in this mindset, this is nothing I developed, this is always just like, this is normal. <laughs> um, I noticed along the way that it's very rare to work in environments where other people actually think so too, that this is normal. So that's why being here in this community, in this environment, feels like a little bit like, whew, uh, yeah, finally home. Um, so, Coming from this like hardware, like greasy raw environment, that, uh, when it comes to technology, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I studied mechatronics engineering, which is like the intersection between mechanical and electrical engineering, and I got familiar with it. I really loved it. A good spirit, nice momentum, nice people. And at the end of my studies, I um, did this mind map. So this is an artifact I just discovered last weekend, where I was like mind mapping out all the things that I didn't know yet. That it was like all the things that I considered part of like an electromechanical system that I simply didn't under fully understand at that time. So that's me in 2008 doing a mind map about computer and computer architecture and all the things around it. So taking this, I was in 2009, let's, let's get the luggage together and fly to Santa Clara Silicon Valley to do a PhD in computer science. And <clears throat> Going from the start there, I just slowly ex explored all those fields, all the technologies, all the stacks, front end, back end, cloud stuff. I did a lot of hardware. So this is just like the greatest hits of like some projects that I did. So this is like a mosaic of handheld devices that kind of assemble like a, a yeah, unified canvas. And this is like some and then, yeah, a lot of cloud work, like computer architecture stuff. A um, lot of hardware, too. Um, this is like a PCB with a lot of devices on it. And one project I'm very, very excited about is the Politics AO, which is like a non-for-profit organization that I founded with people in uh, Brussels. It's uh, essentially visualizing the social graph between politicians, lobbyists, citizens towards legislation bills. Um, so why am I here? Because I noticed that I have this like, natural desire to bring computation to a physical layer and bring physical technology to a digital layer. I really believe in homogeneous systems, and I don't see any reason why those disjunct technologies are disjunct. <laughs> and so I'm here to explore the interplay between physical quantities and zeros and ones as an artistic tool and to make it beautiful and meaningful. So please come by, chat with me. Cheers. <laughs>
on visual artist from Korea. I moved to New York uh, to attend the MFA program at Hunter College. And my work takes many forms, but focus on my effort to negotiate everyday reality as it fits into my adopted American culture. Uh, I also deal with emotions such as uh, stress, anger, anxiety, uneasiness, and obsession through insulation, video, and performance. I printed my face uh, in a newspaper and I pretended to read it and I hide behind it myself in public space. Uh, I started to uh, use video as a medium and um, also I'm interested in combining video sculpture and sound. Uh, so I made a homemade electric chair with the beeping sound and anxiety behavior collage video. And I made a wax cast of an air freshener. Uh, it, these are air freshener each had an MP3 player and earphone and sound of each smell. And I made a champagne shaking <laughs> device. Uh, the champagne finally popped up, but I cannot <laughs> move. Yeah, anyway, finally popped off. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I made this work in class in collaboration. Uh, I plan to make another version of this work, also collaboration and using other kind of technology during my time at SFPC. And, uh, Actually, there was a Korean erotic massage parlor on the first floor of my apartment in Queens. Uh, one of the parlor's visitors asked me if I was working there. So there was a disconcerting and awkward moment. And I became the owner of the fake erotic massage parlor called Happy Ending for a month in my apartment. Uh, I made a real advertisement and I hired a performer as a masseuse, and I made a, a video in which the performer teach how to use the Korean traditional massage tools. And uh, actually, my apartment is located right next to the NW train in Astoria. Whenever the train passes, it makes loud noise, and my apartment shakes. Uh, so I thought I fear an earthquake every uh, many times every day. So I had a solo show with this idea last year. I once uh, experienced the real earthquake. Uh, I felt it as more as a sinking than a shaking. So I covered the floor with the sponge for delivering the same feeling. Uh, I made. Uh, I made drawing machines related to childhood memories that provoke anxiety and discomfort. I used a metronome, cuckoo clock, and cassette tape player, and something like this. And I also installed LCD monitors that play the simple animation related with related to social and political issue in Korea and the U.S. Uh, I made a website for this project. If you visit the website, you can see the animations. And I will try to recreate the animations with the open frameworks in here. And um, this idea came to me when I saw my cat holding a mouse in her mouth. Uh, this moment was the worst experience in my life. <laughs> I cried for two hours. <laughs> and as a result of this experience, I decided to make a safe and playful mouse trap called the Hunting Mouse Project. And I'm going to use the sensors and some hardware work with this project. And uh, I had. I have a show in September at the historical church. I will make an unhappiness manufacturer entitled I Pray to Be Unhappy Every Day. Uh, it will be a moving sculpture, and in SFPC, I want to figure out how to make the unhappiness manufacturer. And, uh, 
Finally, uh, I'd like to finish my proposal for public art project free Wi-Fi zone. The form for this work will be a cafe space, and I really love uh, this work. And, uh, and also, I really like the how in this work art is, art is transformed into public space later than gallery and museums. And it is my favorite movie, Delicatessen, and this scene is my favorite part of the movie. <laughs> and thank you so much. <laughs> Hello, I'm Gonzalo Moyer from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I studied at the University of Buenos Aires, FADU. Uh, this is a famous student. Uh, he lives in the university and he has his own student ID. Uh, this was my thesis project for the university. It's a future length called uh, Todas las Estrellas Están Muertas, which means all stars are dead. And I've been working on this since 2014 with two friends, Rodrigo Melendez and Mariana Olivieri. And we're actually like, very excited because uh, it got selected in the New York Independent Film Festival. And so our process was uh, the following. We wrote, we wrote a few ideas we had. Uh, we described a few images. And then we started uh, rehearsing with the actors for uh, like six, six months. And we gave them a few directions, and we let them iterate through several options. And then we selected pieces we liked, and, 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 and we wrote down those pieces. So this scene, I'm not going to, I'm not going to show it all, but um, came from a simple exercise in which they took turns to, to say a sentence following uh, the, the previous one. Uh, so they created a collective short story. And I always think of this process uh, like debugging. Uh, so while in the university we had this teacher who had uh, a big PowerPoint full of images uh, of, um, of media and film archaeology, and but he had like so so many images and videos that uh, every time he loaded up, it took it took like 15, 20 minutes. Uh, so this problem led to the creation of a research group called IDIS, which stands for Research in the Image and Sound Design. So it became a growing source uh, of data on artists and media. And the project is, is very important because all the information here is in Spanish, and it's important for the public university to provide access to information to any student. So we began working on, around the idea of asterisms, and uh, if you think about the origins of, or, of the culture, uh, to me it's fascinating uh, to imagine people uh, staring at the sky and creating stories and narratives uh, to, to, get, um, to approach something that they couldn't understand. So I made this visualization using the D3 library, and it was a way to create a story from all this knowledge we had in the, in the database. So each dot is, uh, is an entry in the database, and the line is a link, is a link between each, each post. So the lines create a tension between the data. Uh, so I came across uh, Schiffman's tutorials, and at that point, uh, it really changed the way I looked at, uh, the way I thought about code and math. And this is like a, a chat with him, and this is like <laughs> the moment I learned about the school. So I was obsessed with the flogging algorithm by Reynolds. And it's really beautiful because it's a very simple set of rules that create um, a complex structure. And this is like the first time I, I learned about emerging behaviors. So the next thing I did was mixed up like uh, all these projects. So uh, I used the EDIS database. And so each post is uh, an agent in the flogging uh, system. And it's very interesting to see different types of networks being formed depending on how you, how you parameterize uh, your settings. And this is a current uh, test we are doing on BR. 
exploring uh, spatial UI and interactivity. So uh, when I was creating these slides, uh, it was a really an exercise of connecting my own dots in my, in my works. And I found a major theme, theme between tension and, sorry, in the, a major theme between t um, chaos and structure. Uh, and during my time here, I will try to deepen my understanding on emerging behaviors in the intersections of uh, nature and technology. Thank you. Hey, I'm Agnes. All right. So I grew up in Brooklyn. I'm the daughter of two immigrants from Poland. And while they were rebuilding their lives, redoing their educations, I had a lot of free time. And like any kid with a lot of free, unstructured time, I got really into books. <laughs> and books were, and words were a way for me to understand the world around me, explore my own curiosities, become a little investigator in Nancy Drew. Um, and why I'm here is to step away from that, to explore my practice more visually and build physical things, um, use my hands more. So in case you didn't believe me, this is a shirt that said books are kid stuff. So if, not, if nothing else, I need to make a new shirt at the end of SFPC. Um, so I thought I could just share some things that I've been thinking about lately, investigations that are on my mind in the form of questions. Um, one of them is how can we reshape the fictions we've accepted as fact? And how do we take seriously the facts we're mistaken for fiction? So Yelly, I think we have a lot to talk about. Um, it was largely inspired by the book Sapiens. And for the reason that he gives a really uh, simple definition of fiction and fact. So fiction is an invention that requires your belief. And fact will occur whether you believe in it or not. So money is a fiction. Gravity is a fact. Um, and that blew my mind, because I've always taken certain things for granted, like, they, of course that exists. Um, and I think one thing that in the common moment or current moment um, that's maybe perceived as a fiction but is actually a fact is climate change. Um, and I think we need to take a better look at that. Um, at the same time as I was reading Sapiens, I came across the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows and came across Oculism. Um, and it's the awareness of the smallness of your perspective. And I think that's kind of dangerous when we don't have words to describe what we're grasping with, because then we can't deal with it. Um, and so that's something I've, I've been thinking about a lot. So in the effort to make something physical, um, I created a mini world that's about like two feet long and a foot wide, where you actually have to crouch down uh, to look into two different peepholes. And one is uh, really concrete and brutal and gold, and the other is mossy, um, and it's separated by diachroic film. And it's really just to have you question, like, what does my world look like today, and which one do I prefer? And this is just uh, some photos of the juxtapositions that, you're, that we're constantly dealing with in our everyday decisions. Um, another question I think about a lot, and it sounds like Yale does too, is what are the hidden messages embedded in our physical world and what do we want them to say? Um, I look for stories and buildings in addition to books. And one of my favorite buildings I ever learned about was uh, La Pedrera in Barcelona, um, especially because of these balconies. So Antonio Gaudí fashioned these balconies after a bird that makes a nest out of its own excrement. And it was a commentary on the family that was like, accumulating too much material wealth and building a nest out of their own shit. Um, and I love that, that that was the hidden message here. And I think our buildings around us, um, without us even realizing, are telling us so much about the way we live. Um, and I would love to explore projection mapping to figure out and evolve those narratives um, something that's more current. The last question I've been thinking about is, um, how can we nurture more than we conquer? Um, and that was really brought about by this book uh, by Naomi Klein called This Changes Everything. And it's all about um, how capitalism is ha hampering any kind of moves towards uh, reducing climate change. Um, and it's really around like if we're growing all the time, if we're conquering all the time, we're not really nurturing what we have. Um, and that became really apparent to me last year or two years ago when I was in Brazil working with a group on a permaculture project. 
Um, this is a picture of Max, my teammate, who saw tarantula on the floor, on the forest floor, and just put it on his shoulder. And I was like, what? <laughs> I would never do that. Um, and it, that's just not an attitude that I see in the US of like having a respect towards um, our natural world. So that's something that I came away with of like, we're not working with nature, we are nature, and how can we bring that attitude more towards um, my culture? So asks for the audience, um, if you have a story of like going from this really heady practice to something more um, physical and your creative process, I would love to hear from you because that's what I'm going to be going through. Um, resources for projection mapping and generative text or anything on visual theory. Thank you. Hello. Cool. <clears throat> hey, Redacted. Sorry to message you about this so close to the slide deadline. I know the deadline's in place for your sake, and I respect your time. The depth of introspection that an about me requires can kick off really intense feelings sometimes, and I'm in a bit of a hole. I'm comfortable doing a talk tomorrow, but scraping my past and defining myself positively is a taxing process. I'm staring at blank slides, and I think I need to step outside and get some air. I'll have a talk tomorrow, but it's not coming out painless. Again, I'm sorry for complicating things. If you throw in a placeholder slide, I'll do my best to help out with setup however I can. I'm not planning to focus on my past work, so a blank slide should be pretty close to what I need for this presentation anyway. Here's a summary of what I'll talk about with hopes that it'll help you arrange my talk with the others. I'll start by talking about how lucky I feel to be here, surrounded by folks that inspire me. I've been humbled throughout my life by the extraordinary people I've met and admired. I've met folks who have been further along on a journey and who have been patient enough to teach me. I've met folks on different journeys, who have been kind enough to welcome me into their spaces and accepting enough to let me hang around. I'll stress that point because that's kind of the big thing for me while I'm here. I'm excited about tomorrow because I'll get to learn more about the folks in our batch who I'm already so impressed with. And I think, as Amit put it, the most important day of this program is the first day after it's over. I'm so confident that the folks I'm spending time with are gonna help me define what that looks like. I came here with plans, so I'll also go into some of the topics I'm focused on. Mental health hangups aside, I want to participate in this, and I think I'll give a good talk tomorrow. <laughs> I'm sorry for putting a bug in the schedule. Good night. Hey. <laughs> um, I'm Riley. Um, I spend most of my time excitable and in love with the world around me, and some of it in a pretty deep hole. That's where I got to last night. I wasn't feeling the self-reflection clearly, and uh, somehow, even though I'm still not, here I am sharing more intimate side of myself than I ever have with the crowd. It was important to me to read that email because anything else felt like a severe omission. If you met me elsewhere, you might get the impression that I had shit really together. That's one reason going over my, my polished portfolio felt dishonest. After sending that email, I went for a walk and had an idea. So for the rest of the talk, I'm playing a supercut of visuals I programmed while depressed, when I should have been sleeping, along with the commit timestamp. There are literally hundreds of these. These are just the first couple I grabbed. I stayed up most of the night arranging this video, and yes, I see the irony. <laughs> day to day, I think I'm pretty happy and excitable, so this feels like a really weird intro talk to give. But it's all I could really write last night, so I'm going with it. There's time still, so I want to reintroduce myself by sharing some of the things I'm investigating in my practice. I just wrapped up a three-year engineering gig at Khan Academy, which is an education nonprofit. Working there, I thought a lot about education systems and their reinforcement of class structures. That's something I'm continuing to focus on. I'm also thinking about deletion, permanence, and consistency. Silicon Valley starts data because it entrenches people in their past behaviors. 
corporate culture's emphasis on consistency is ableist, colonizing, transphobic, and it represents a growing discomfort with people's fluidity. I hope someday we'll celebrate an international day of deletion in place of fake Facebook holidays. The last one I'll mention is technology with a capital T and how society relates to technology in general. I'm terrified of the systems we've built under capitalism, and I'm not optimistic about finding new solutions under unchanging systems. So I'm looking into maintenance and decentralization as potential alternatives to the Silicon Valley narrative. Thank you for your gracious attention. I'll be around, and I'm happy to talk. My name is John Katungi. Uh, I'm an artist. Uh, some of my previous work, some of the most recent stuff, uh, has been hybrid animation stills with uh, JavaScript. Um, and these are just video, video clips, but the premise behind them is that uh, none of it will ever be the same twice. Uh, they're all unique, generative, and that really excites me, especially within the, the medium of something still. Um, and there's a picture of me playing saxophone. Um, Saxophone was, um, and music was my first love, and I, it's, it's the lens through which I view everything. Um, but I'm, in order to talk about the stuff that I want to make here, um, I want to contextualize that where I'm from. Um, I'm from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, um, and I am the son of two Filipino immigrants. Um, why they chose South Dakota, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> and you can maybe imagine what the type of demographics were. Um, in the schools uh, that I had growing up. Um, but I think, the, regardless of where my parents landed in America, um, I think they decided to raise me in the idea of, of why they came to America, which is for a clean slate. Um, and this clean slate that they gave me, um, as in not teaching me the language or not you know, <laughs> teaching me a ton about Filipino culture, uh, it let me approach America as this thing that I had no expectations, no prejudices, no, no, no like thing that I should thought I should avoid or any kind of thing like that. And so obviously it made me a lot of like a lot of people, TV, movies, video games, cartoons, all this type of stuff really did raise me and taught me what America was, regardless of what these people looked like. Um, well, maybe maybe it's because none of them looked like me. Um, I took everything, you know. Um, maybe you might not be able to see this, but this is uh, a scene from Stomp the Yard. This is one of my most formative YouTube videos I've watched so many times. Uh, this is the Spice Girls. Um, and I didn't realize until recently that this, uh, this picture of the Jabawakis, they actually do look like me. They are Filipino. Uh, but I wouldn't have known that because they always wear masks. Um, but the thing with all of this media uh, growing up that I approached it with this keen sense of otherness because none of them look like me. And I had this absolute like ignorance of cultural context of these highs and lows that I experienced as an Asian American. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, I, I felt much more of a connection to this than I, than I saw with like Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee, Mr. Miyagi. Um, and I had trouble explaining that to my peers a lot of the time. Uh, but moving forward, um, going to college, I got a degree in math. Um, I fell into math because of the idea of reductionism that, you know, psychology can be reduced to bi biology, which can be reduced to uh, chemistry, to physics, to math. Um, and that really helped me um, shape a way that I viewed the world. Um, but besides that, uh, I wasn't a particularly great student. But what math did help me with was form a logical way to look at the way that I consume media. Um, and these works of art uh, are ways that I applied this logic and I feel an intense gratitude for. Um, similarly to, to, to Riley uh, and similarly to a lot of people, uh, we went through hard times um, with depression and I don't know anyone's issues, but with me, um, 
these, these pieces of work really helped me both, um, work through that. Um, Kendrick Lamar's Tip of a Butterfly, a very honest introspection, but broad look at the world. Atlanta's quirky look at racialness and how that can feel weird. Albert Camus' um, reasons why we should continue living, and Kadinsky's way of bridging the mathematical to the artistic. Um, and going forward, um, I want to make art like that. I want to make art that feels good, um, that will speak to a broader experience, but help me car um, carve out a sort of cultural identity and hopefully um, help me connect to people in the process. Thank you. Okay, can you hear? Yes. Um, hi, my name is Sarah. I'm a, recently a software developer and engineering manager. And this is a picture of me in Brooklyn on 12th Street in the 1970s. I had my hair in rag curls um, to make myself look like a doll that my grandmother had given me. <laughs> um, and this is me now on 12th Street, the same childhood block I grew up on, but a different block. It's where I'm staying in F SFPC. And I'm sharing these images because I feel like there's a lot of crossing over, revisiting, reintegrating in my life right now, and not just simply geography, but um, from integrating different types of work, from performance to writing and technology. And so to me, SFPC is an integration point. Uh, my childhood aspiration was to be a writer and a truck driver, as a truck driver would dictate their novels while they drive the truck, and then in the night tent by the side of the highway, write them out. <laughs> um, I wrote books but didn't drive a truck, and that led me to theater, which led me to experimental performance, which led to technology, to graduate school, and I came out as a software developer, which I've been doing for quite a long time, since about 2001. And these are words that are associated with the fields. And notice the ones under the software developer are much more business-centric. And that's because these are the software company's favorite shapes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, there's nothing wrong with growth, but I feel like when you zoom out and the world they support, it's kind of like there's, a, there's wonderful, awesome people working really hard in what I call this sort of gee whiz patriarchy, <laughs> sending money up to the venture capitalists in the sky um, with some, with some challenging narratives that keep it all going. So I, I enjoyed a lot of the work, but the culture chafed. Um, I went to work for Hillary Clinton, which was a really different and amazing um, technical experience. And when that was done, I just stopped everything. I just paused, spent a lot of time learning, learned how the blockchain worked, and applied to SFPC. Um, my process when I'm making things is to use my body and experience as a kind of a sensor to visualize the structures of things. And, I've done a lot of technology and coding work, but I'm actually sharing with you um, a very old project that I did, which is um, a video performance piece that was for me about the physical pull of inarticulate things, when we don't have language to express things or we're pre-verbal. And uh, it was called Crawl, and my grandmother and I made a dress for it together, and I just crawled very slowly across 30 or 50 physical landscapes, and it was just, how do you, what is compulsion? What is forward motion? How do you, how do you move without words? Um, it was slow going, it was physically exhausting. Um, and a lot of what captures my imagination is making the invisible visible and framing things that we don't see. And in a way, my creative process itself is kind of this force within that I don't always understand. Um, I believe ideas originate in the body, in what makes us uncomfortable, and ideas are also embedded in the systems that we interact with, and the body and our systems interact. Um, and to this end, uh, I admire the work of Temple Grandin, who's a, she's a scientist, and she makes systems out of her lived experiences of autism. And she, she designed a hug system, and she designed, I, I don't like this one as much, but a system to make being slaughtered as an animal easier. <laughs> Um, but I'm inspired because I feel that using our lived body experiences is a powerful starting point for design, and I'm interested in doing similar projects. Um, sort of on a fun note, this is a, my friends and I have an online catalog where we have imaginary body extension machines, such as wish fulfillment goggles or mm -hmm. Photoshop lenses, and we just write these things up and invent them. Um, recently, in order to help myself with spatial orientation, I started making visualizations of basic data structures and algorithms. And these are just some flat, 
representations of quicksort, but I start to think, what do these things that we rely on in computer science look like and feel like in real space in the analog world? What would, what would quicksort look like as a book? What would, what would it look like as a sculpture or a machine? So that might be something that I work on here. These are some of the ideas that I have. And I just see SFPC as a wonderful time to collaborate with people, 10 weeks of play as a way of reshaping a life. So thank you. Okay, uh, first, okay, <laughs> who I am? Um, okay, I'm Paola, just call me Paola, it's shorter. And I asked to my mother for a picture and she sent me this. And for me, it's like a child uh, watching the, the world because I, I like to explore everything. And, oh, sorry. So for a long time, uh, I've been working in the, in the publicity and the agencies, and uh, I study graphic designer, and uh, I work a lot for, for museum, and I did a lot of stuff like this, video walls, uh, VR experience, a lot of stuff. But the problem in publicity is the quality, the times, because the time is money. So for me, I ask all the time why I'm, I'm doing uh, all this. What is the, uh, the focus? What is the deal? What is the, wh what is the communication? Where, what is the message? So I have this for Anton and Irene. They say, step out of your comfort zone and do stuff that makes you nervous. So I did stuff, like simple things. And then uh, was how hack a vending machine and they give you a code. And then uh, in the beginning was uh, uh, understand the machines. And then the next step was uh, what happened with the people? What happened if I don't use a touch screen and I use a microphone have an input? And I have this video, sorry for the uh, sounds, but the people were screaming, what happened? Uh, the alcohol helps a lot because it was a party. And the people need to scream for uh, activate the application. And for one point for me was, okay, this is new. This is something I, this is no publicity. No, this is not an agency. I, I feel like, again, like my, the first uh, picture, like a child, I'm discovered the, the war again. So. Uh, I take the decision, so I quit uh, to my job. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think in that point was, okay, I've been working for 10 years in, in publicity, uh, doing a lot of stuff in design, in coding, and, and then I explore a lot, but was, what is next? What I, I can do? So with my best friend, we create something because we don't have a place, we don't have anything. It's, the call is brillo. Brillo is like shine it's funny, in English. Like, I mean, it's like we want to create a, a place for do a stuff, for make mix, mistake, uh, explore, uh, for teach, for learn, for everything. So the problem that we have is what to tell, how, and why. I, I think that is the reason why I'm here is what, what, I, why, what I can tell, how I connect people, to, uh, how, it's, I don't know, it's a lot of questions, how, what I can do, what, what is the message, what is the narrative? So, uh, this is it, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> So I'm interested in exploring different ways of expression. Um, this is the project that I came to SFPC with 
uh, making colors from sounds. Four performers use their voice to create accompanying visuals, complementing and juxtaposing their audible performance. I'm also interested in breaking the performer audience uh, barrier. I'm really fascinated by Pauline Oliveros, who took that very seriously in her work. I wish I had more time to talk about Pauline and her ideas of listening as activism as a form of self-care and introspection prior to action. So please come and talk to me about this, because it's awesome. In 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada released their executive summary as a 400-page, 14-megabyte PDF. I worked on extracting a plain text uh, web-hosted version to make it more accessible with deep linking and integrating with the, read the TRC video project. And Oh, there, now it's going. Uh, I don't believe that tech can solve most problems, but occasionally my skills can be useful, and accessibility is a niche where that's sometimes true, so I'm interested in that. And uh, in light of events that have happened in Canada since I came to New York for SFPC, I just want to let you know that Canada is not some like racism-free utopia or something. It's pretty bad. <laughs> At 26, I discovered that I'm bi or pan or something. Uh, now I've gone from rolling my eyes at songs about love and crushes to writing some, but they're, <laughs> they're queer normative, so I feel like it's a little bit better. Uh, and now I find the heteronormative ones even more annoying. Um, this is a sample of something I recorded last fall. So this is really hard for me. I was raised Catholic, and shame and fear of judgment have really powerful effects on my life. Uh, listening to that song, I can hear that I'm barely singing. I sang it in octaves, which kind of sounds cool, but it makes it more textural than a featured thing. And I put my voice way down in the mix, so you, pretty, you probably couldn't understand what I was <laughs> singing unless you were listening really hard. And I had to edit that last paragraph like six times to force it into an active voice. Um, shame and fear of prejudice. Uh, of judgment are, are weird. Um, I think they help me a bit to steer me from becoming too much of a tech bro. Um, but <laughs> I also think they're part of the reason that I feel acute panic about checking out with my awesome pink lightning cable at the computer shop. Um, I'm so ready, but also like really dreading the clerk asking me, oh, did you want that one? It's pink. Um, I think that kind of fear of judgment is really fucked. Um, and so this is like a really scary list for me to read, but I'm going to read it for all of you. These are things that I would love to like not feel that about at all, starting with the worst. Uh, so like going somewhere and like browsing and buying lipstick maybe, um, looking at and trying on clothes made for women, nail polish, um, accessories like pink cables that now I can do, uh, and the hair care aisle, like hair dye specifically. My beard is supposed to be this color, but it came out <laughs> black this time, so I'm still learning. Uh, over time, I've been able to sort of, yeah, convert some of those feelings from like shame to, uh, I don't know, challenging people to question those kinds of choices. Um, so I have another song that's about self-made men, and I have another one that's about pausing before sex with a woman to ask if she's sure because she won't be able to donate blood because if a woman has sexual contact with a man who's had sex with a man in the last 12 months, she can't donate for a 12-month period. Even though I've been tested, we use protection, and I'm past the nine-day window for detection. But who said Health Canada policy should make sense and not be homophobic? I'm happy with these songs, but I find it a lot harder to write non-cringy words about the periods of emotional presence and detachment that I felt at the end of my last relationship, raised this male in a society that tells men that emotions are for girls. Um, so that's kind of why I'm here. Tech is a familiar medium that I want to keep working in, but I want to learn to make better poetry. Thanks. All right, all right. So thank you. Thank, thanks for all the presenters. Um, just want to thanks again for all of you to visiting us and all of you 
looking at this from live stream. A um, couple of teachers are tweet, like tweeting and texting me that they're watching Isaac in Taiwan <laughs> and <laughs> other people. Um, and I saw a lot of teachers uh, here, like um, you know Robbie Kraft and Kelly Anderson were here, and former teachers like Lauren McCarthy is visiting from LA, so I'm super happy to see her. And then also alumni, bunch of alumni here. So I'm very excited. Um, so let's enjoy ourselves, and um, I'll see you all in April 21st, which is a uh, showcase for these wonderful folks. And we're offering some um, short-term workshops in the summertime um, that range from a week to two weeks. And then uh, we'll be having an open call for fall semester uh, that will start in September 15th. So bye. <laughs>